Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. So among all the hyperbole that exists in the fitness and human optimization spaces, the world of peptides decided to run with a blended compound called the Wolverine Stack. If you're familiar with peptides at all, you've likely heard of this. And we've discussed the components individually, but today we're going to talk more specifically about the blend and its risks, BPC-157 and TB-500. Is there credence to this synergy? Are there risks? Is there any data behind this concoction at all? And I think given its popularity and our commitment to research makes these reasonable questions to address. Because if I just sat here and said, yeah, bro, these two will definitely work to fix anything and everything, I'd be doing you all and myself a service. And I'm sure there are people out there saying, yeah, it'll fix your rotator cuff and heal all your past relationships. But as we discussed before, there are certainly risks with BPC-157 alone. So are they augmented or decreased? These are tough questions to answer, but I'll try my best. Before we swan dive into the details though, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and like this video if you enjoy this sort of content. My mind is beyond blown that a peptide-only channel that dissects boring old research articles has grown to this number, like 3,000 subs. But let's keep the train rolling. It's been fun making these videos and interacting with all of you, but enough lovey-dovey from Peptide Buddy. Jeez. All right, so BPC-157, which we've announced a billion times, is a pentadeca peptide derived from human gastric acid. And we've literally broken up the research categorically from musculoskeletal involvement to mood to structural neurology. And if you want to dive through all the intricacies of these, I encourage you to check out the BPC-157 playlist on my channel. I don't pride myself on much, but the amount of detail we've covered on this channel with BPC is, I can say with confidence, pretty darn in the weeds. We even talked about the BPC-157 conspiracy that exists in the peptide community. Fun stuff. But the overview is that, although not particularly well studied in humans, the data collected from BPC-157, which stems from academics in Croatia, has gained popular interest in the world of healing. It's shown to exhibit properties of angiogenesis, enhanced wound repair, and all Although is lauded for different curative properties, is thought to specifically involve itself in gastrointestinal repair given its derivation from gastric acid itself. Now, when people find success with BPC-157 alone, why would they add TB-500 into the mix? So the basis of TB-500 is a peptide called TB-4, and you'll often see them used interchangeably, and to be candid, I did at first. But there are some distinct differences to be aware of. TB-500 is a synthetic derivative of TB-4 and although less popular than BPC-157, at least from what I hear, the utility of synthetic TB4 has been more well-researched in humans. But as you'll see, pointing out the pertinent data in this case is, well, quite difficult. We'll talk about structural differences in a bit. So TB4 itself is found diffusely throughout the body. And as one of multiple thymusins, TB4 was initially derived from the thymus, but found to be present in all these different types of cells and tissues. And like BPC-157, Seven, the reputation of TB4 is that it assists in different realms of healing and recovery. And as is theorized about BPC as well, TB4 has shown to promote angiogenesis via upregulation of VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. It's also exhibited that it has a hand in many different physiologic processes involved in regulation of actin binding, ocular health, systemic inflammation, and sepsis, antioxidation, and apparently a myriad of other things. Most of the clinical development development behind synthetic versions of TB4 has been done by a pharmaceutical company based out of Maryland called Regine RX Biopharmaceuticals Inc. that seems to outsource a lot of its R&D to Asian companies and their products predominantly investigate the role of TB4 in management of different conditions of the eye and elsewhere. They're also working on an injectable product called RGN352 which seeks to manage a more diffuse array of conditions from myocardial ischemia, i.e. heart attack, pathology involved involving the lungs and kidneys, and even diseases of the central and peripheral nervous systems. And a phase one trial that took place in China was completed in 2021. And a couple things that came out of the evaluation of the drug in this phase one study are an estimated half-life of 0.5 to 2 hours, yes, quite vague, transient increase in tumor marker, SCC, that returned to baseline after cessation, so theorized to be due to regeneration of epithelial cells. And there was also this notion that the drug was pretty well tolerated. Now, when we do our own research on TB500, it is quite frankly difficult
difficult to ascertain what is essentially responsible for what since there's not any regulation on its compounding. And as this 2012 case report states accurately, it is presented as the synthetic peptide of the active region of thymosin beta-4, TB4, without any further qualitative description such as amino acid sequence or molecular weight. Truer words have never been spoken. Trying to get a grasp on, you know, what is 100% true in the world of peptide research is something that I have been trying to cope with because it is so tough. The limited data in conjunction with just people passing around terms and details that are likely not accurate definitely contribute to this. And now let's go back to the differences between TB4 and TB500. Since even now it's tough and the amount of inaccuracies on the web are pretty blatant and uncontrolled for. So TB4 is the endogenously, diversely present peptide that we just discussed. And you oftentimes see that TB500 is called TB4. And this is complicated because TB4 is 43 amino acids and research of synthetic derivatives like the region Rx has come in different formulations, but TB500, real TB500, as we discuss, is just just seven amino acids. It's technically TB4, fragment 17 to 23, and it's considered the active fragment. And that's not to say the data surrounding TB4 alone in general is exclusive of that, including TB500. It's just one of the many unclear things involved in peptide research and popularization that should be addressed. That said, scientists have sought to evaluate efficacy of different fragments of the TB4 peptide, including with regards to this fragment, 17 to 23, or TB500. The next natural question to ask would be, is there any data behind using TB500 and BPC157 together? And the answer is yes, I mean almost, kind of. The study looked at BPC157 and TB4. The fragments, if any of which were included in the compound, was unspecified. And in my opinion, it's pretty unreliable study for a couple of reasons. One, it was a retroactive study to look at intraarticular knee pain where patient charts were reviewed over the course of a year. This alone would not be too dissuading for me, but the study took place at a health optimization clinic that promotes peptide use. And if that's not enough, patients were contacted, only 16 of them total, and asked how their pain was before and after the peptides. Now, that may seem reliable to some and might carry a little bit of weight, but personally, I I can't remember what I had for breakfast two days ago. That said, 3 out of 4 patients who used the combo blend reported subjective improvement, and 11 out of 12 people who used BPC alone reported subjective improvement as well. Now if I had to assume that this was an always legit, and by the way I'm not trying to be too critical here, I'm aware, trust me, of how difficult it is to conduct any sort of research around peptides, but I think maybe you watch these videos for my take, because it's definitely not my graphics or my high-pitched voice, but if I I had to pull something from this limited collection of data, I'd say BPC-157 alone showed self-reported efficacy in patients with knee pain. Not much more than that. Differentiating between TB4's role in that since 11 out of 12 patients who are enrolled at this institute reported benefit, it's pretty unsurprising that 3 out of 4 who received both and likely paid a high premium for it would not react similarly. Now like with all this stuff, we've got to somehow create a risk-benefit analysis when the data is so limited. I will say, there is a lot more clinical info on TB4, the derivative peptide alone, than there is on legitimate TB500, or this fragment. And that's not to say it won't work. And as such, it's surprising that people have more strongly turned to BPC157, and like I said, this isn't really confirmed mathematically or anything like that, but mostly through my conversations with others and what I've observed. And interestingly, BPC-157 is pretty generally under-researched too. That doesn't mean none of these things work. I think that while the scale is tipped towards BPC right now, the clinical evaluation of TB4 and its synthetic derivatives will likely gain public favor later on. And I'm fascinated by the interest it's gained in the realms of dysregulated immune response and neurologic diseases in particular. But these are just a few things that interest me, who am I to tell you what's cool? And I'm curious of my viewers, those of you who know a friend who took one or both of these things, what was their experience? Because where I'm a bit at a crossroads, 
is that I think many people's discomfort, whether it's musculoskeletal or more visceral, I would guess that popularly people are just as inclined to choose between BPC or TB500, like a coin toss essentially, or maybe they just jump right into the combo blend like Augustus Gloop dove into the chocolate pool in Willy Wonka. Now, I'm hesitant to think that starting with both is by any means necessary for anything, and like with all of these blends, my recommendation is not to. Among site-specific reactions, like rashes, discomfort, or other bothersome physical adverse effects like headache and fatigue, my biggest fear is accelerating angiogenesis to worry some concerns. And given the paucity of research, I can't say how long would it take because I'm sure I'm going to get that question, but as both of these peptides likely increase formation of new blood vessels via vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF, I am fearful that those with genetic predispositions or unknown dysplastic cellular collections might have accelerated formation of tumors. Not to say that this will happen certainly, but modulating VEGF has been evaluated as a possible treatment for certain types of cancers, and promoting formations of new vasculature in general is one of cancer's signature characteristics. It's an MO. And due to its prevention of apoptosis or programmed cell death, which is vital for healthy cell line survival, TB4 is in some realms of research considered pro-cancer, and some researchers actually think it would be worthy to investigate it as a target, as it minimizes efficacy of a chemo therapeutic drug called Taxol. The moral of the story is that all of these peptides are fascinating, and I think in some people, once clinically developed, it'll serve extraordinary benefit. They are not a land of opportunity devoid of risk. So what we can do is be aware of these risks. And so I'll link the data that I read through to make this video in the description below because some of you may find it helpful. All in all, I really hope you enjoyed this. If you haven't already and made it this far, please hit that like and subscribe button. And for further content, a link to the Patreon will be in the description description below. As always, have a great day. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy.